I want us to begin by looking at one verse in the Old Testament that will serve kind of as an introduction to tonight's lesson. And that verse is Psalms 106, verse 48. Psalms 106, verse 48. Verse 48 says, Blessed be the Lord God of Israel from everlasting to everlasting. And let all the people say, Amen. Praise the Lord. Adolf Zaffer, commenting on Amen in this verse, writes that most everyone knows the literal meaning of Amen as so be it. He goes on and comments, And yet few consider the deep meaning, the great solemnity, and the abundant consolation treasured up in this word, which has formed for centuries the conclusion of the prayers and praises of God's people. A word which was frequently used without due thoughtfulness and unaccompanied with the feeling which is intended to call forth loses its power from this very familiarity and though constantly on our lips lies bedridden in the dormitory of our soul. I wish I could write like that. And how true it is about the word amen. I, when I started this lesson decided that's what it was going to be on, I was amazed at some of the things I discovered about this word and how it's used throughout the Bible, both in the Old and New Testament. Yes, it's a short word, but it's amazing how much, how many truths are, are in this one little word that we can discover. The first thing I want us to do is go back to the Old Testament and look at the meaning of the Hebrew word that is translated and then see how it is used in different ways in the Old Testament <clears throat> and then come to the New and see how Jesus uses it. Because Jesus uses it in the New Testament more than anyone else. And surely there is some significance to that uh, fact. We'll begin our our word search, our meaning search in 1 Kings chapter 1. 1 Kings chapter 1. This is like the, the typical <clears throat> uh, meaning of it, usage of it. 1 Kings chapter 1. <clears throat> and we'll begin reading in verse 32. 1 Kings chapter 1, verse 32. And King David said, Call to me Zadok the priest, Nathan the prophet, and Benaiah the son of Jehoiada. So they came before the king. The king also said to them, Take with you the servants of your Lord, and have Solomon my son ride on my own mule and take him down to Gihon. There let Zadok the priest and Nathan the prophet anoint him king over Israel, and blow the horn and say, Long live King Solomon. Then you shall come up after him. And he shall come and sit on my throne, and he shall be king in my place. For I have appointed him to be ruler over Israel and Judah. Benaiah the son of Jehoiada answered the king and said, Amen. May the Lord God of, the, may the Lord God of my Lord the king say so too. There's the basic idea of what Amen is. You know, may the Lord make it so. So be it. Let it be so. When amen is said in that context, it expresses certainty. So one of the things we, we should think about when we say the word amen, whether we're agreeing with somebody about something or at the end of the prayer, a prayer or whatever, is that we say this with certainty and confidence. It's not just like closing a letter saying sincerely, it's not like that at all. It means let this be true. Let this come to pass. And you're saying it with confidence that God will do just that. If you look in Strong's uh, dictionary, he has for this Old Testament word to be firm, solid, to be dependable, trustworthy, established. See, there's the idea when you, when you say a prayer and you pray for this or pray for that, then you, when you say amen, you're saying that, that this is firm and established. This is certain. I can trust God to fulfill 
this prayer in whatever way he knows is best. See, there's certainty involved in it. It's not just a casual word that we throw out. It has great meaning, and it always has, going all the way back to uh, the Old Testament times. It's always had some very relevant meanings to it. We see a, a, a similar but slightly different usage of the term in Deuteronomy 27. This is something else we need to consider when we're thinking about the use of this word, Amen. Deuteronomy chapter 27, and we'll begin in verse 14, and we'll just read a few of these, but all the way through the end of the chapter, uses this word translated, Amen. Deuteronomy chapter 27, and we'll begin in verse 14. This is all about curses. And the Levites shall speak with a loud voice and say to all the men of Israel, Cursed is the one who makes a carved or molded image, an abomination to the Lord, the work of the hands of the craftsman, and sets it up in secret. And all the people shall answer and say, Amen. Cursed is the one who treats his father or his mother with contempt. And all the people shall say, Amen. Cursed is the one who moves his neighbor's landmark. And all the people shall say, Amen. And he goes on with one after another after another. And he ends up in verse 26 by saying, Cursed is the one who does not confirm all the words of this law by observing them. And all the people shall say, Amen. Now, when people were saying amen there, they were basically agreeing or ratifying what was being said. So when the Levites were saying, cursed is anyone who treats his mother and father with contempt, and when the people would say amen, they were basically agreeing to that. They were ratifying it. And it was a, like saying a very solemn oath that, yes, anybody who treats their mother and father with contempt should be cursed. And so when amen was used in that sense, that's what they were saying. They were confirming it. Or we might use the term verifying it. Yes, we agree that person should be cursed if they make a graven image, uh, if they do not follow the commandments as he mentions in verse 26, or they do this or that. Yes, we agree, we confirm that, we verify that that is right and we're going to follow it. So again, when we say that word amen, it has some great significance. It's not a word we should just kind of throw out. When we agree with somebody and we say amen, we need to make sure that, that we truly mean that because it does have these deep meanings associated with the word. So when these people again were saying, you know, cursed is this person, and they would say amen, that had some significance. It was like uh, confirming an oath. We will be bound by that law. Very significant. Also, the word can sometimes carry the idea of expressing trust and confidence, especially in God. It's a very interesting usage going all the way back to Genesis. Genesis 15. Turn with me back there. This is about Abraham. Genesis 15. This is God's covenant with Abram. Genesis 15. And we'll note verses 5 and 6. Genesis chapter 15. Verses 5 and 6. <clears throat> this is about the, the word from God about uh, he would have an offspring. Abraham would. Notice verse 5. <clears throat> then he brought him outside and said, Look now toward heaven and count the stars if you're able to number them. And he said to him, So shall your descendants be. And he believed in the Lord... And he accounted it to him for righteousness. Now, where does the word amen come in there? You can put the word right in there for believe because it's the same thing. And he amened in the Lord. 
and it was accounted to him for righteousness. He amened in the Lord. So when Abraham was believing in the Lord, believing in his promises, trusting in them, having confidence in them, what was he doing? He was saying, Amen to the Lord. I have confidence that you will do exactly what you said you were going to do. Look at those stars. That's the number of descendants you're going to have. He didn't have any right now. But he so trusted God and he was depending upon God and was confident in God. So what he was doing was he was amening God. He was amening that promise. Yes, I believe it. I'm counting on it. Why? Because God's reliable, God's trustworthy, and God is someone we can have confidence in. So when God gives promises, when the Bible says, He that believes and is baptized shall be saved, we should amen it. Say, yes, we believe that. Why? Because God said it. And He's reliable and He's trustworthy and we can have confidence that when we believe and are baptized, we shall be saved. So any of those promises we see in the Bible where God says, if you do this, then this will happen, we should amen it. And speaking of the New Testament, let's see it's in the New Testament. Now, basically the word amen is not translated in the New Testament. A lot of times it's transliterated. In other words, you see the word amen, that's just taking the Hebrew word and just making it into Greek and then translate it into English is all they did. Sometimes it is translated, though, as we'll see in this case. When you look at all four accounts of the gospel, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, the only one who uses the word amen is Christ. No one else uses it in all four accounts of the gospel. It is just Him, only used by Him. And I want to look at several cases and you'll see the significance because usually when Jesus used the word amen instead of ending something he began a statement with the word amen and depending on your translation it might be verily verily or it might be assuredly assuredly or truly that's how it's often translated in the New Testament let's look at several of these we'll begin in Matthew Matthew chapter 5 <clears throat> we'll see one of the first times that Jesus uses this idea. Matthew chapter 5 and note verse 18. Matthew chapter 5 verse 18 says, For assuredly, I say to you, till heaven and earth pass away, one jot or one tittle will by no means pass from the law till all is fulfilled. That word assuredly there, that comes from that amen. Amen. Well, what's Jesus saying when he says, for assuredly I say? He's saying, what I'm getting ready to tell you is the absolute truth. You had better listen carefully because it is true. You can count on it. It's important. It's trustworthy. Listen closely. Move to Matthew chapter 16 another time. Jesus uses this, this word amen over and over again in his uh, lessons. Matthew chapter 16, verse 28. Very end of the chapter. Matthew chapter 16, verse 28. Assuredly, this is Jesus talking, or amen, I say to you, there are some standing here who shall not taste death till they see the Son of Man coming in His kingdom. One of those verses that Jesus says, Know for a fact that the kingdom is coming in the lifetime of some of those people that were there present. Yes, the kingdom came in the first century. It's not something that's going to happen in some sort of premillennial uh, uh, time period or during some thousand year reign. None of that's going to happen. Kingdom already came. Jesus is already reigning. So he says, listen closely. Assuredly, amen. Jesus says this is important. Pay attention to it. Matthew chapter 18, verse 3. You now, when Jesus called the little child, set him in the midst, say, Assuredly, I say to you, unless you are converted to become as little children, you will by no means enter the kingdom of heaven. Amen, Jesus says. 
What I'm getting ready to say is trustworthy. You listen closely because it is important. You have to be converted and become as little children if you want to be in the kingdom of heaven. John chapter 5, verse 25. And Jesus, I mean, we could spend ages looking at all of these accounts, but John chapter 5, verse 25, Jesus says, Most assuredly, I say to you, the hour is coming and now is when the dead will hear the voice of the Son of God and those who hear will live. Listen closely, he says. That time is coming. Then in John chapter 8, the last one, verse 58. We could have chosen any number of them. John chapter 8, verse 58. Jesus said to them, Most assuredly I say to you before Abraham was, I am. Jesus says, Amen, Amen. This is important. It's like a flag that Jesus would put at the beginning of a statement so that people would sit up and listen. Jesus says, Make sure you hear what I'm going to say because it is important. Jesus told those Pharisees, those Jews, Before Abraham ever was, I existed. Before Abraham was, I existed. The Bible says that it's through Christ that God's purposes are established and His promises certain. In 2 Corinthians chapter 1, Paul brings this to mind when he says the following. Beginning in verse 17, he was talking to the church about planning to come to see them. Verse 17 says, Therefore, when I was planning this, did I do it lightly? Or the things I planned, do I plan according to the flesh? That with me there should be yes, yes, and no, no. But as God is faithful, our word to you is not yes and no. For the Son of God, Jesus Christ, who was preached among you by us, by me, Silvanus, and Timothy, was not yes and no, but in him was yes. And notice verse 20. For all the promises of God in him are yes. And in Him, amen, to the glory of God through us. Notice it says, for all the promises of God in Him are yes. They are certain. They are certain. And he says they're amen. They're accomplished through Christ. They're firm and established and set by Christ. And so all of those promises, you know, Jesus promised that He was going to build His church. And he did. It was promised that the church would begin in Jerusalem and from there spread out to the world. It did. And on and on and on, those promises. There's a promise of forgiveness of sins. There's a promise of peace. There's a promise of hope. And on and on, these promises. And they all come through Christ, right? Beginning in Ephesians chapter 1 and on. All of these blessings are in Christ. Why? Because He's the one that is bringing them about. And we can count on them. This idea of Him being Amen is found throughout the book of Revelation. Most, first of all, Revelation chapter 1, verse 7. <clears throat> Revelation chapter 1, verse 7. Behold, He's coming with clouds. And every eye will see Him, even, though who pier even they who pierced Him, and all the tribes of the earth will mourn because of Him. Even so, amen. It's a certainty that Jesus is coming with clouds and that every eye will see Him. He says that's a certainty. There is nothing anywhere by anybody that can keep that from happening. That's what he's saying. Remember in Acts chapter 1 when the two angels said that as Jesus ascended into heaven, you know, why are you standing looking the same way he went into heaven? He's coming back. Not to be on earth. He is coming back to do what? Gather his saints with him. Right? Gather his saints. 1 Thessalonians 4. That's what he's going to do. So that is going to come to pass. And then in the very last chapter of Revelation... Revelation 22, 
<clears throat> verse 20, he says much the same thing. So the book of Revelation, Revelation chapter 1 and Revelation chapter 22, both of those talk about the certainty of Jesus coming again. Verse 20 says, He who testifies to these things says, Surely I am coming quickly. Amen. Even so come Lord Jesus. He is coming. Let it be so. Amen. And John in the Revelation even calls Jesus the Amen. In Revelation chapter 3 verse 14, when he's writing to the church of Laodiceans, he says this, And to the angel of the church of Laodiceans write, These things says the Amen, the faithful and true witness, the beginning of the creation of God. There he's called the Amen. He's the last word. He's the final authority. So he is the one that we can count on. He's the one that we have confidence in. What he has said is trustworthy. So when he says he's coming again to gather his saints to take them to heaven, that's exactly what he's going to do. We can count on it. It's certain. It's a fact. Nothing is going to keep that from happening. Whenever the Father decides that event's going to happen, it's going to happen. You and I don't have a clue as to when that's going to happen. The angels don't even know, do they? They don't have any idea when Jesus is coming back. We know that so many people have predicted it over the years. And you know how many have been right. That's correct, not a single one. Because there aren't any signs he's coming back. He's going to take us by surprise, isn't he? So we don't know when, but we do know the fact that he's coming back. It's repeated throughout the book of Revelation. He's coming back to take us with him. So amen is not just a word we say at the end of a prayer. It's a rich word. When we say the word, we need to say it with confidence, with belief, with trust, uh, understanding that it's because not of us that we can be trustworthy or confident, but because of who we're saying it to. And that's God the Father. When He makes promises, He keeps them. He's reliable. He's trustworthy. So when we say it, we want to make sure we mean it. Yes, He is the Amen. He said, All authority has been given to me in heaven and in earth, on earth. What did He tell them to do? No, go make disciples all over the world. What were they to do? Teaching them, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Same thing is going on today. When someone is baptized today according to God's Word, they're being baptized with Jesus' authority. And quite often when someone is baptized and, and they come up out of the, wor uh, the water, what do we say? Amen. It's a certainty it's determined, it's reliable that what they've done is follow God's instructions. And we should say amen to that. Tonight, it's, it's your invitation. Invitation to do what's right, if need be. To become a New Testament Christian, to ask for forgiveness, for ask for the prayers of the congregation. Those prayers are important. And especially is it so when we say amen. Let us stand and sing this song.